I apologize for the balagan. There were some, uh, you know, changes, and it's, uh, after all, what we call Middle East time. So, uh, and we have in, in our panel, in addition, Dr. Hassan Selim Ozertem, and uh, he's going to be the fourth. We are trying to squeeze it as much as we can. And I would like, without any niceties and preliminaries, to ask Mr. Dan Meridor, Deputy Prime Minister, who filled many other positions, to uh, yeah, former, yes, but uh, to talk about Israel is the changing Middle East, and I emphasize changing, including, of course, uh, what's going on in Iran, if you may. And also, we had a discussion yesterday about the uh, various options, either to exclude Turkey uh, from the uh, project of the gas, uh, oil or not, and I would like very much to hear you, you about it, please. Good morning. We uh, definitely live in a period, an era, that is characterized more than by anything else by the quick, accelerated pace of changes in our life, in our society, culture, economy, politics, defense. Things are changing rapidly and uh, it is not easy to follow the changes. In time of such huge, dramatic changes, uh, the important uh, thing is to try to understand it in time and adapt yourself to it. The first thing one has to admit, and let me do it as one who was in charge of intelligence, that we had no clue a day before the Arab Spring started it's going to begin. Had you asked me in January 2011 whether it's possible that Egypt will be turned upside down, Tunisia and all the Arab world, I would tell you, you're out of your mind. And it is, uh, I think, a very important lesson, before I say anything, to know that we did not know. I think we have good intelligence. I think the Americans, the British, others have good intelligence. And none of us knew. Not only we didn't know, Mubarak didn't know. Omar Sliman didn't know what's going on in his own backyard. And the first lesson is, I think, modesty or humility. We need to know that we don't, and the world may be changing in a very rapid and dramatic way without us being able to detect it in time and relate to it in time. We will know, I think, 80, 90 percent of what happens. We will have the right prediction because we know a lot and we analyze it and we read a lot. But the remaining 10 or 20 percent may be crucial. And this is what happened to us uh, with the Arab Spring that uh, started two and a half years ago, practically three years ago, and is changing the, the Middle East quite dramatically. So the first lesson, I think, is modesty. The second is that we live now in a time of instability, and what is certain is that we, don't, uh, we will not enjoy stability in the coming years. Now, I, I, I want to say something about technology, which I think is the basis of all that we see. Some of it has to do with the discovery of gas in the deep sea. Uh, it, it was always there. What changed is technology that let us uh, dig in. There was a, a minister in the Israeli cabinet for many, many years, uh, Dr. Yosef Bug, who had a sort of sense of humor. He died some years ago. He used to say that God, he was a religious guy, that God is unfair because uh, he gave uh, us the, the holy land and the Arabs the oily land, and we had no oil. So this was now corrected either by God or by technicians or scientists, and we have an access to energy. But I'm not an expert in geology or, or in energy. Let me say uh, something about the way technology changed and is still changing the Middle East above the earth, not, not, not in the deep, uh, um, uh, deep uh, the depth of, of, of the ground on which we tread or in the sea. The Arab world has never known any democracy. It's the only part of the world that democracy has never penetrated. Strange, but this is a fact. Technology broke borders, diminished any, any, any uh, way of governments to control 
information flow, movement of people, ideas, technology. And on the uh, wave of American or Western technology, the Western ideas did penetrate the Arab world. And they penetrated in a way that people saw another way of life. A lady could have lived in a tent in Saudi Arabia for years, like a mother and grandmother. She would never see what she sees now on the screen, a strange picture, a woman driving a car. It's possible. No, the government cannot stop it. It's there. People in Cairo saw that in other countries, so vividly, people speak of government change, of human rights, of democracy, and people want the same for themselves. This is, I think, how it started with Western ideas, very different from revolution we have known in the Arab world. First, no violence. Take Tahrir Square as the main project. No violence by the demonstrators. Second, it was not a revolution that was uh, initiated by any army officers or by a political party. It was by people like us. And thirdly, the slogans were not the usual s Muslim slogans of uh, no, down with America, kill the Jews and all the rest of it. It was taken all from the Western vocabulary about democracy, freedoms, uh, responsible government, no corruption. And it created a lot of sympathy uh, all over the world. And uh, along the process, they were able to take down regimes that sounded and looked very, very solid, like the Egyptian regime. And then uh, there came the paradox, so to speak. Uh, in democracy, one of the rules is the majority has to speak, not a ruler by the government, by the army, or by, or by God, but the people. And then there were elections. And here's the paradox. What if the majority doesn't want democracy? What do you do with that? If majority doesn't want to see women equal to men, or doesn't want to allow people to criticize religion or government, where is the formula to solve this in a democ democratic way? So we saw uh, the revolution, so to speak, that was initiated by Western ideas and people who wanted this, I wouldn't say hijacked, but taken legitimately in a way by another uh, force. <coughs> the movement of the uh, Juan, the, the brothers, the Muslim Brotherhood, that it was uh, a movement of 90 years old from the 20s uh, of the 19th century, of the 20th century, was always banned. Uh, has a lot of support. This movement, Muslim Brotherhood, and other uh, cousins or brothers or sisters of that movement all over the Muslim world. And in the realm of values, battle over values, battle over ideas, of way of life, what we see now is not necessarily forces of, of uh, uh, dictatorship against Western ideas. You see very strong religious uh, uh, fanatic ideas fighting with modern Western ideas. And the battle is not over. One could have thought that Egypt has uh, gone the Muslim Brotherhood, Morsi is a president, and that's the trend of history. But the pendulum seems to tilt back, and we see now Egypt in a different way altogether. Look at Hamas, who thought that they have their sister movement in power helping them. Now it's the greatest enemy, the same Egypt. And if one looks, deeper into that. It's not just a question of who rules a country. It's about identity. More people would tell you now, if you ask them who you are, not we are Arabs, but we are Muslims. Somebody may say, I'm Shiite before I'm Iraqi. Think of the following alliance. An Arab leader, Muslim Arab leader, Lebanese leader, has a is a bosom friend and the closest ally of a non-Arab leader called Khamenei because both of them have the same religion, Shiite. Crosses national identity. Whereas we could see in the Arab world in the 50s, the national pan-Arab movement, Nasser and others, there is a decline to some extent of the national feeling at the expense of growing religious feeling. Identity becomes, in some parts, more religious, religion-oriented, or based on religion than on national uh, identity. Think of organizations that are what we call non-state actors. 
because the, the technology made people much more powerful. Tom Friedman, in one of his books about uh, globalization that he published about 15 years ago, The Lexus and the Olive Tree uh, is the name of the book, coined this uh, term, super empowered individuals. People are now much more powerful than ever in history. Nobody can block information, science, uh, money, technology. It's not in the hands of government, not even in Oxford or Cambridge or, or, or um, Harvard or Yale. You can sit on an island in Indonesia. If you click the right button, on the, you know it. Government cannot have uh, that control anymore. People are much more powerful. It looks wonderful, but the bad people, what we may call bad people, are much more powerful as well. And people uh, have a, a capability of causing damage, not only good, in an unprecedented way. Think of the following. There was decades, there were decades of Cold War. Uh, the Soviet Union has built an army with hundreds of billions of rubles against the American or the West, couldn't kill one American soldier, and collapsed because they didn't have enough money to sustain it in the late 80s, early 90s. In steps, a guy called Bin Laden might have spent two or three million dollars, caused damage to America that nobody ever <coughs> caused in history. Because the world has changed. The neighbor is not the enemy. Manhattan was not attacked from New Jersey. It was attacked from Tora Bora. And think of the cyber war. It's a total change caused by technology. In the Middle East, it caused a real uh, turmoil. Uh, call it spring or winter. It's not over. I don't want to go deeper into that. I'll come to Israel in that, in that res in respect, but I'll say that uh, my, my view is that if, in the end, the people who want religion to be the answer will gain, they will go back to the Middle Ages. If they are ready to take uh, the Western ideas, not against religion personally, but against the religion, the paradigm for politics, then they may go for modernity. It's a huge battle. The fact that the revolution is not, is not finished in a day or in a year is quite natural. Think of the French Revolution, 1789, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. And after this, the guillotine and, and Napoleon, it took a long time until <coughs> France was really uh, democratic, the way we, we love to, to think of it. Maybe the end will be good, we don't know it yet. But no doubt it's a huge battle over, over where the Arab world goes. Do they go to modernity or do they go back? Muslim Brotherhood's logo, the logo of the party is Islam will khal. Islam is the solution. To put it very simply, you have problems with the family, pray more. You have problems at work, don't study more. Pray more, be more observant. God will reward you. And it's not about religion as a, as a private thing. It's about religion as the main paradigm to solve your problems. To me, it's going back in history. It's not going forward. And this is what the, what the battle is all about. One could have thought after the... 18th century of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, religion is limited to the personal. In Western Europe still is, but when you see all over the world now, all over the Muslim world, in some parts of the, uh, the extreme edges of the Jewish world, in Russia with the collapse of the, of the communist regime and the, and the re-emergence of the Pravoslav Church, in another country, I don't want to mention in name, the evangelist community becomes very important. This is something very interesting to me frightening, but this is a huge battle. And the Middle East is caught in that battle. Uh, and the nationality of uh, Al-Qaeda, what is it? They will tell you Ummat al-Islam. What's the nationality of the Taliban? Ummat al-Islam, of Jihad. So we, we really see a huge, much, much deeper uh, currents or undercurrents <coughs> that shake the Middle East now. Then the question, who leads what country in what time? And it's not over. And we are in the middle of it. We have the uh, good uh, fortune, because we don't know what to do about this, the good fortune that we cannot do anything about it. Even if we want to, to go in that direction, that we have no influence over it. Even big countries, bigger than us, uh, have uh, awakened from the dream that they can shape the Middle East by <coughs> enforcing a regime. We cannot. We are spectators in the, on this very interesting theater. We are in the first row. It may affect us, but we can't do much about it. We need to guard ourselves and our interests. What, what are our interests here? Egypt. Well, this was the first Arab country to have signed a peace treaty with us. Sadat, Begin, 77, 79, changed the Middle East radically. 
for more stability, for the beginning of acceptance of Israel as a fait accompli and a, a neighbor you need to live with. It was a huge revolution. The stability of the Middle East, the, the, the very slim chances for war all stem from this. For us, it was of great importance that this remains this, the, the treaty and it is not, it is not um, torn to pieces by the Muslim Brotherhood for whom we don't exist. We don't have a right to exist. And I have to say now that this treaty that was started in 77 st and signed in 79 stood all the tests. The murder of Sadat in October 81, he signed it, Mubarak continued. 30 years of Mubarak, Muslim Brotherhood came to power. No, still, first Mubarak is down, the army was there, it was uh, intact. Even Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and uh, Don Mr. Musi who couldn't even utter the name Israel on, the, on his lips, on the level of intelligence and, and the connection with army to army, it stayed solid. He did not say anything negative openly ag the very against the very existence of the agreement. And now that uh, there was another regime change and uh, General Sisi is in power, we see Egypt fighting, the Muslim Brotherhood, fighting for control over Sinai and maintaining their peace with us. Very important, very important to us and I think to the stability in the Middle East and to the values that we believe in. Jordan. Uh, Jordan sees the world around it not in a very promising uh, mood. Syria is crumbling down. Who knows what's going to happen there? <coughs> is this going to be Muslim Brotherhood state? Is this going to be another? Not clear. Um, is this to be going to be an uncontrolled land for which land uh, terrorists may come? Iraq, its neighbor on the east, after the Americans showed their power and everybody was uh, how was the word? Shock and awe. And then they saw the limits of American power and America cannot really manage Iran and they are out. What will happen Ira uh, in Iraq? They don't know. Egypt was on the, sh on the, s on the, on the edge of leaving uh, uh, Jordan alone when the Muslim Brotherhood was there. And they have Israel with, with which they have a very good uh, relationship. Most of it not openly stated, but we have very solid relationship with Jordan and we wish it to continue. I think it's a, it's a major source of stability in the Middle East. Then look at Syria. Uh, there is a human tragedy here that one cannot overlook. It's, it's awful, 120,000 people getting killed. Uh, we asked ourselves when I was in the government until some months ago, what is good for us? In one of the debates I said, who cares? Suppose something is good for us, can you do anything about it? We can't. If we help somebody, it will be to his detriment because he's helped by the Jews, God forbid. And, and so we look at it. <coughs> that uh, Syria was our staunch enemy. They have an army, they have a lot of missiles, they have invested a lot in very sophisticated uh, Russian or Soviet weapons and others, and now this army seems to be somewhat less effective than in the past, let me put it mildly. It doesn't exist as, as an army, so for us, not so bad. But what is the, the morning after? What will be Syria like? We have no clue, we don't know. It seemed that Assad was on the way down. Iran, Hezbollah, Syria, uh, this triangle worked well with Russian backing and they saved um, Assad for now. For the coming year, everybody wants him to stay in place and disarm the, the chemical weapons. What is the morning after? We don't know. If it's going to be not a solid, well-controlled country, what do we do if a rocket is launched at us from Syrian territory? Do we attack the Syrian army? They have no control. Do we run after, s after every organization differently? We'll give uh, a lot of interesting challenges uh, to, to, our, uh, to our people here. I, I can go on, Hamas is now quite isolated. Hezbollah is caught with uh, wars with the Arabs, so it looks good. The bad thing, of course, I think, is that there's the illusion that the Palestinian story can stay like this, a huge mistake of our government. We cannot stay like this when you take initiative, it's not part of this story. Let me end with a, what this uh, uh, short remarks, what uh, this uh, conference is all about. There may be more assets now, that is to say gas, oil, in the Middle East. There is a, a verse in, in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, the more assets you have, the more worries you have. So more assets, marben chasim, marben de'aga. If you have more assets, it can be for the better or for worse. You can have more reasons to fight, and if you are reasonable and rational, you'll have more reasons to cooperate. Uh, the, the reservoirs of gas know no boundaries. 
there are boundaries in international law. I think it's our interest to make this new uh, asset, new big reservoir, or reservoirs in plural, a source of more cooperation and more common interests between all the participants. The Palestinians have it in Gaza. They call between Hamas and PLO. Who has it, of course? It's not clear between them. Lebanon has it, but the government is not functioning, so they don't issue permits. So we have been the first to do this. <coughs> Turkey is, a, to me, I just say it because you mentioned, a very important country in the region. Unfortunately, the relationship is not at the best now. <coughs> there was a change of regime in Turkey some 10 or more years ago. And the Prime Minister of Turkey has a different agenda. I uh, tried very much to correct some things that we have done. I think the awful tragedy of the flotilla was a big tragedy. We apologized. I think we should have done it earlier, but the fact is that he doesn't want the apology. And we, uh, even before the flotilla, he attacked Shimon Peres in a very violent way in a, in a conference in Europe. I think it's crazy and it's totally irrational. The two countries, Turkey and Israel, Objectively, are very close. Both of them are Western countries in many ways, non-Arab countries, prosperous countries economically. Turkey economy is growing wonderfully in the last 10, 15 years. Allies of the United States of America, Turkey is even a member of NATO, and not to cooperate when everything around us is, is trembling is simply irrational unless somebody has different dreams. So I hope that even Turkey finds a way, and we find a way with Turkey to rejoin hands as we've done in the past. Not to exclude Greece and others, but we can build more positive assets and more cooperation in the Middle East because of the uh, oil or gas that new technology has allowed us to, to develop. It's one of those things that changed, changed our world, and we need to adapt to the changes and do it the best way. Thank you. I'm sorry we couldn't go further. Maybe we'll have time for uh, questions later. So we rush now to Professor Michael Emerson from the Center of European uh, 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 Policy Studies. He's going to talk about fishing for gas and more in the Cypriot waters. Please. Uh, can you have the mic, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what's, uh, what's your plan in terms of timing? 15? 10. 9, 8, 7, 6. What? <laughs> right, I'm very happy to be back in the Truman Institute after a gap of about uh, one decade. Um, <coughs> but I picked up the brochure at the back there, which I found rather interesting. Uh, this brochure that has the slogan, Building Peace by Peace. Now, Moshi, was it you or some other bright spark who invented that one? I think it's, it's well done. Yeah? <laughs> but anyway, I'd like to uh, use that uh, piece by piece. I think we've got three pieces on the table here. Uh, there's the Cyprus piece, uh, P-A-C-E, and there's the Israeli piece, P E A. And then there's the uh, Cyprus-Israeli link, uh, peace, P-I-E-C, uh, all together. And the question is whether these pieces um, <coughs> can add up to, or could add up to something uh, that would be justifying uh, the label of this conference, which is all about uh, the geopolitics of the East Mediterranean mm -hmm. because of the gas. Hmm? And so uh, that is the question I'd like to explore. I meant to speak mainly about Cyprus, so I will go into Cyprus now, but I will come back to this, uh, these three pieces, possibly putting them all together uh, at the end. <coughs> um, now, from the, from the point of view of uh, Truman Center as uh, peace engineers, I would say Cyprus is the best candidate you, you have to uh, try to work on because uh, the objectives are rather clear, reunifying the island, and the, there are no existential threats uh, at play here, and there's no real 
theocratic fundamentalists who are in opposition either. So, um, relatively speaking, this looks, uh, you know, rather relatively easy one by your standards. <coughs> However, there's some interesting similarities between the two. Both uh, have been close to agreements. Uh, Israel-Palestine at Taba, uh, at the end of 99. So the deal was on the table, but then Yasser Arafat said no. And then in the mid-2000s, uh, um, Anand Plan was on the table, and then the Greek Cypriots said no. And so uh, both parties have been taken to the altar, but at the, moment, at the last moment, uh, one of the parties in each case said, said no, but at least a structure uh, had been created. But now also, uh, both the Israelis and the Gazans and the Cypriots have gas. So there's a new commonality there. <coughs> so I'm going to ask or suggest that we debate whether the three pieces can be uh, put together. But now I go a little bit more uh, into the um, Cyprus question <coughs> and the interests of the parties there. Now, uh, Greek Cyprus uh, needs uh, to exploit the gas badly uh, because of their financial uh, difficulties. Um, now, uh, so they've got some prospects there. However, uh, Turkey has been <coughs> going in for a little bit of gunboat diplomacy to try to deter investors. Whether that does deter the investors is not at all clear. I mean, I think uh, things are going ahead in the Greek Cypriot uh, bloc uh, 12, etc. But still, the Turkish position <coughs> uh, doesn't help and pr pr presumably has frightened off some of the big international oil companies who might otherwise be going in there. Now, the northern Cypriots, I um, guess they would like normalization within the EU. Um, at least two-thirds of them say that. Uh, but the status quo is kind of, is kind of normal already uh, there. Um, and after the Greeks, uh, Greek Cypriots rejected the Anand plan, basically they're left with all the territory. And, uh, um, and so basically the, the Greek Cypriots uh, deprive themselves of, of uh, getting certain advantages. So from that point of view, the northern Cypriot situation is not that dramatic. Now on the Turkish question, this is the, this is the interesting one because it's not so clear uh, what are the Turkish interests, speaking as of course as a non-Turk trying to understand uh, uh, complex Turkey. I got at least four theories for the Turks. One, they're actually happy with the status quo. The second is that they're quite happy to play the spoiler uh, in the way that I've just mentioned for geopolitical reasons. Third, um, they regard the Cyprus question as a bargaining chip in relation to the EU. And then uh, fourth, the nicest argument of all, uh, actually they would like an agreement over Cyprus, but it's only the, the Greek Cypriots who are so difficult that it's not possible to get an agreement. So you have this mix of possible Turkish uh, arguments. However, the peace process, the Cyprus peace process, um, is about to resume, and there are a number of new positive elements that uh, open it up, perhaps. One is that even under Christophias, uh, the idea of revenue sharing of the gas uh, was put on the table in a very superficial way, but at least that was a gesture. Uh, and secondly, the new president, Anastasiadis, although he's been consumed in his first year by the terrible financial crisis, he is on record for um, advocating a much less centralized and less strongly federalized constitutional settlement uh, than the uh, conservative Greek uh, Cypriot nationalists would like. Hmm? So he has something in common uh, with the uh, Israeli experience uh, there. <coughs> um, <coughs> and then third, of course, the crisis which pushes them uh, towards uh, a solution. And then the final question then is, going back to the Turkish question, is Turkey ready for turning or moving in the pursuit of uh, an, an agreement? <coughs> well, um, 
I think the most important element here, now we heard uh, some of you were not here yesterday, I can see because there are many people who were not here yesterday, but we heard from the uh, Greek Cypriot ambassador and uh, I tried to um, question whether his new president Anastasiadis was uh, going to be <coughs> interestingly forthcoming with respect to a different constitutional solution uh, compared to what uh, his predecessors. Well, I'm afraid the um, ambassador who, uh, of course, uh, had to say what he had to say, uh, showed no sign of movement whatsoever. So that was rather, uh, for my book, rather uh, disappointing. He even um, put in the same boat together. Now, this is a very precise point, constitutional point. He said, we want a federation, like we want a serious federation, not a confederation, uh, like Germany and Belgium, for example, he said. This opens actually the very interesting model question because the German and Belgian federations are not the same. Um, and uh, let's forget the German federation, that's not the relevant one. The Belgian model of federalism is highly relevant because this is uh, a two entity federation and it is a case in which uh, the functions of the Belgian federation in the last uh, 30, 40 years have been largely uh, devolved uh, both upstairs to the European Union and downstairs to the entities. So <coughs> uh, the Kingdom of Belgium and the Federation of Belgium doesn't have all that much to do at the federal level. They're, they're lumbered with a load of historic public debt and there's a little bit of an army and a king. Uh, now transposing this into uh, the, the Cypriot situation, well, it's even easier because you don't need an army for a demil future demilitarized um, Cyprus and you don't really need the, the Belgian social security regime, which is a bit overloaded in any case. So you have a model here for uh, a Cyprus. Uh, you can still call it a federation if you like the word, but of course the other side don't like the word. They like prefer the word confederation. But so let us evacuate these no-go uh, words and, and get into the constitutional um, specifics where there is a, a unique possible solution due to the fact that uh, this Cyprus I is in the U European Union and all of the citizens of Northern Cyprus are citizens of the European Union uh, uh, as well. Um, <coughs> so um, uh, that's, uh, that's, in my view, that is the key to opening it up. But the qu question is whether uh, President Anastiadis is willing um, in the forthcoming peace process to signal that he's willing to go that way because the Northern Cypriots actually want uh, pr precisely, uh, precisely that. And whether if Anastiadis makes this move, whether the Turkish side uh, would be willing to reciprocate by um, in, 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 in obvious ways. I uh, mentioned the, the gunboat diplomacy uh, and... Uh, the issue of guarantor power, presence of the Turkish military are obvious elements. The other elements in this Cyprus peace process really can follow rather easily. There's a whole set of minor trade restrictions that should be simply abolished. Um, they're not very effective in any case. Um, the property issue is very difficult, but there's quite a lot ongoing there in terms of, if you like, microeconomic settlement of, of property issues. Um, there's some map adjustments that can be made, but that was well worked out in the Anand plan. And there's the gas uh, sharing uh, business, the revenue sharing business that can be uh, nicely uh, filled out. Now, to come to, come to the, um, the gas options, uh, now this is where the, <laughs> the other pieces come into play. Um, now, uh, uh, for the LNG plant to be uh, feasible, uh, we discussed that a bit yesterday. Uh, Cyprus needs a bit more gas than what it has already discovered. And so uh, an Israeli link, pipeline link from Leviathan through to Aphrodite would be very helpful. Although uh, the, the Greek Cypriots may find more gas in, in, the, in, the, in the second round. But that could certainly be a useful piece in the linkages. <coughs> um, but then uh, there's also, uh, as we discussed yesterday, uh, the, the peace pipeline concept, that is to say uh, um, a pi gas pipeline uh, from southern Cyprus into northern Cyprus and then across into Turkey. 
Well, that's an interesting link, and technically it would be the nicest. Uh, however, um, uh, there would have to be a turnaround in the Greek position very clearly and very fast for that to become uh, a relevant uh, uh, hypothesis. At the moment, uh, the Turkish problem is so difficult uh, and we can't trust the Turks, say the Greek Cypriots, uh, so we have to focus basically on, on the LNG. So time is running out there because this LNG business may go critical, in which case that will be off the table. But this, is, this would require a huge transformation of the trust factor between Cyprus and, and Turkey, which, however, of course, is um, absolutely desirable. Now I, I finish now by just coming back to the idea of the three pieces together. And I've profited a lot from a very interesting conversation uh, at breakfast time with, with both Moshe here and, uh, and, and Kivans. So there's this intriguing prospect now picking up, after all, the, the slogan the title of the conference, that these three P pieces could be put together. Um, now, the, the Cyprus peace process, that's a, the logic of it is easy. And the peace, uh, PIEC linking the gas pipeline from Leviathan through to Aphrodite, that is also a clear, <coughs> as it were, technical possibility. <coughs> the more difficult one, for those who like uh, this romantic idea of putting all the three pieces together, is how the Israeli and gas, uh, Israeli and Gaza gas could factor into the Israeli um, Palestinian uh, peace process. Uh, this is not obvious, uh, much more difficult, but it's still a very intriguing question if it could be turned in that way, in some way. And I think the only way to try to, well, one way of trying to pursue this is to go into the Gaza gas question. How is the Gaza gas going to be exploited? Who will have to be present there? And how, and in, in particular, what uh, Israeli support uh, would there have to be for that, either security or economic uh, support? And then if the Gaza gas business starts flowing, how will that affect the politics of Gaza versus uh, West Bank? And does that lead into some uh, new dynamics? Well, all of that is too speculative as of today, but as Moshe and Kivans are already thinking, this is really an excellent topic for further research, which is a usual concluding remark by researchers. <laughs> <coughs> The time, the time we needed to, uh, to bring it here, okay? Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, <coughs> I would like to thank also the organizers, although I am one of them, um, uh, uh, for this um, beautiful conference. And I would like uh, to dedicate uh, uh, my speech to the memory of Mikhail Stanhum mother. Um, uh, uh, of uh, the mother of my calling uh, uh, working here at the Truman Institute. Um, so as you know, um, uh, after a series of uh, bellicose incidents uh, happened between 2008 and 2013, um, a, a successful cooperation between um, Israel and Turkey came to an end. In a classical example of the policy of the enemy, of my enemy is my friend, Israel, Cyprus, and by extension Greece, uh, came together into a natural alliance which turned primarily not against Turkey, but against the past and their own historical tradition. Indeed, unlike Turkey, Greece recognized only de facto the state of Israel in 1949. Greece-Israel relations during the Cold War period remained cold 
Indeed, but contrary to general belief, Greece was not hostile towards Israel. Three main reasons accounted for that. Greek government's fear of repercussions for Greek minorities in Arab countries, Athens' wish to elicit Arab support over Greek-Turkish conflict in Cyprus, and in the 80s, the fact that the ruling party at that time, uh, the Panhellenic Socialist Movement, uh, had an aggressive, though only verbal, anti-American, pro-Palestinian, and pro-third world in general orientation. Therefore, for a long period of time, there were negative sentiments and biases within the Greek society towards Israel and the world Jewish community. They partly came from the left, it, it's remarkable, from the left, of the political spectrum as a result of the fraternization with Palestinians in the PA law, but also from the political right based on their anti-Semitic conspiracy perceptions. Only in spring 1990, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of a new balance of power in the Middle East, did the new right-wing government in Athens decide to recognize Israel the Euro as well. In the Gulf War of 1991, Athens supported the coalition against Iraq and helped Israel indirectly, indirectly by sending a frigate to join the blockade against Saddam Hussein's regime. Relations between Israel and the Republic of Cyprus unfolded differently during the Cold War. Israel considered Cyprus to be highly important both because of its geographical proximity and because it viewed the Republic as an integral part of its peripheral policy aimed at breaking its isolation from the Arab states. Unlike Greece, Cyprus did not yield to pressure from the Arab countries, mainly from Egypt, but also from the Cypriot community in Egypt, not to establish full and formal diplomatic relations with Israel. Thus, although it became an active member of the non-allied movement and was maintaining close ties to the Arab countries, it also cultivated fruitful economic and commercial, commercial relations with Israel. This brought significant profits from Israel, is visitors to the island and technical aid provided to uh, Cyprus tourism through various Israeli institutions. Nevertheless, the fear that the recognition of the state of Israel without a simultaneous recognition of Palestine would entail a risky precedent in the Cyprus conflict and the political fraternization with the Palestinian people prevented Cyprus from setting up an embassy headed by a resident ambassador in Israel until 1994. While these developments aimed at offering a new start for relations between Greece, Cyprus, and Israel after the Cold War, they were hampered by Israel's close ties with Turkey. Only after Turkey's Israeli relations became strained in, in, in 2008, could the foundations of a new relationship covering cooperation on economy, energy, and defense between the three countries be laid down. Starting in 2009, Greece gradually set a pro-Israel course supported by the major paris, parties of the time, continuing but until today. Following Benjamin Netanyahu's historic visit to Greece in August 2010, the first by sitting Israeli Prime Minister, a multi-level cooperation between the two countries started to develop. The political determination for closer ties was successfully tested in December 2010 when Greece organized a multifaceted full day rescue operation for Israel which was hit at that time by a serious natural disaster. The improvement of bilater bilateral relations was also reflected in the remarkably bilateral trade volume, which increased from, from 
89 million euro in 2009 to 200 million euro in 2011. In August 2012, Simon Peres became the first Israeli president to pay an official visit to Greece and hold discussions with the Greek political leadership. The discussions aimed at further deepening Israeli-Greek bilateral ties and expanding cooperation in a <coughs> wide variety of issues, especially on diplomacy, security, and economy. Israel needs Greece because it lacks strategic depth and, in part, maritime experience. Greece needs an ally that can provide strong technical and strategic support. Therefore, cooperation between Israel, Cyprus, and Greece covers military affairs as well. In February 2012, when Benjamin Netanyahu, Netanyahu became the first Israeli prime minister to visit Cyprus, the two countries signed a military agreement allowing the Israeli air forces to use the airspace and territorial waters around the island to protect vital energy resources. In spring 2012, Israel and the United States invited Greece to join them in a joint military exercise. This annual naval event in the Mediterranean, codenamed Reliant Mermaid, was first held in 1998 and had involved Turkey. But it was canceled in 2011 when Turkey withdrew, and the following year Greece was invited to take its place. With Athens on board, the exercise was renamed Noble Dina, and the overall mission of the training was changed from search and rescue exercises to attack and defense scenarios that included repelling enemy assaults, anti-submarine submarine warfare, and aircraft operations. The fact that the Greek and Israeli air forces simulated repelling attack on offshore natural gas, gas and oil rigs indicated that any future threat from Turkey was being covered. Additionally, Israel replaced through this exercise the strategic depth it had lost through the termination of the defense cooperation it formerly had with Ankara. The expected economic benefits from natural gas and oil reserves have also contributed to the formation of the Israel-Cyprus-Greece alliance as the Cyprus exclusive economic zone which borders westward Greece's exclusive economic zone also borders Israel's Leviathan bloc in the eastern Mediterranean. As European demand for the relatively clean power of natural gas will remain high, the Cypriot and Israeli energy deposits discovered recently are expected to contribute to the EU being energy independent from Russia. This would fulfill a goal pursued by Washington for decades to stop Moscow's tactic of using its natural gas exports as the principal means of projecting economic and political influence on the continent. We saw that recently in Ukraine. Thus, Washington's support for the recent Triangle Alliance is not solely the result of Jewish lobbying, uh, like many people tend to believe. It seems that the Americans also consider it preferable for these deposits to belong to their legal uh, proprietor, excuse me for that, please, uh, Cyprus, as opposed to Turkey, which threatened Nicosia with military action should it push on with the drilling. Turkey, which invaded Cyprus in 1974 and still occupies much of the northern part of the island, has been contesting the ownership of these fields. Ankara contest, and Mr. Professor uh, laid it out uh, very precisely, uh, I guess, Ankara contests the fact that the areas with gas reserves in the eastern basin of the Mediterranean that stretches from the Levant coast to southern Crete and maybe beyond the are estimations uh, <coughs> that uh, indicate that uh, um, 
these gut reserves stretch beyond Crete, are situated in clearly divided natural waters. Its objections are referring to both the waters between Turkey and the Cyprus Republic, or the Republic Cyprus, which is not recognized by the Turkish state, as well as to the waters situated between Greece and Turkey. Israel, on its part, logically seeks to diversify its export routes in several directions, to Jordan, to Turkey, or to the Cypriot liquefaction plant, as it seems to follow a policy of not putting all Israel's eggs in one basket. However, the, the, that enterprise faces some very big challenges. Uh, the ambassadors yesterday spoke about the prospects. <coughs> I will speak about the challenges and the difficulties. Given Turkey's unpredictable relations with Israel, as well as the continuing instability in Egypt, Israel's only politically safe and culturally friendly passage to the West seems, I'm not claiming that it is, but it seems to be through Greece. It means that any pipeline distributing natural gas to Europe from the Eastern Mediterranean would have to pass through Cyprus and Greece. On the other side, Ankara would view a possible export route to European markets through the Mediterranean, connecting Israel, Cyprus, and Greece as a threat to its own ambitions to become the major non-Russian transit route for gas sales and a regional energy hub. Indeed, Tar Turkey has begun to voice its eagerness to be involved in the transportation of natural gas reserves discovered by Greek, Cyprus, and Israel to Europe by linking the issue on the, re the resolution of the Cyprus problem and on the negotiations between the EU and Turkey, which include an energy chapter that has not been opened yet. Turkey's coast seems at the first sight to be an attractive option for delivery gas from Israel's Leviathan field. Why? From there, Israel gas could fit into Turkey's national grid. It's a very important thing or join the Trans-Anatolia natural gas pipeline that Azerbaijan and others plan to build across Turkey. It could also link up directly to the trans pipeline that European and Azerbaijan uh, oil companies plan to build from Turkey into Greece, Albania, and Italy. However, the pipeline to Turkey would have to go through the internationally recognized exclusive economic zone of Cyprus, an option that Cypriot officials rule out at least before a settlement of the Cyprus dispute. A part of the political constraints, experts warn that there are additional constraints against it, uh, like the significant sea depth between Aphrodite and Turkey, the relatively problematic subsea terrain, as well as the Turkish Russian energy cooperation. The Italian energy giant Eni Company wants also to transport compressed Israeli gas to Cyprus on its own way, as it possesses natural gas liquefaction plants in Egypt, and its interests do not comply with Greece's interest in the region. Lebanon claims that the bilateral agreement on the demarcation of maritime borders among states signed in 2010 between Cyprus and Israel and ratified a year later conflicts with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The construction of a subsea pipeline to Greece, albeit it offers sufficient access to trans pipeline, which will go through Greece, or to the Greek natural gas liquefaction plant Erevithusa, could also face competitive pressures from Russian supply sources whereas it requires difficult, long subsea transit routes. All things considered, one can conclude that both the energy architecture, architecture in the Eastern Mediterranean and the future of the Greece-Israel-Cyprus relations are, in my opinion, dependent, mainly dependent on Israel, on its decision how to deliver its gas to the world markets on whether its real enemies, its enemies are real enemies and its friends are real friends. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your eloquent talk. And now, last but not least, Dr. Hassan Selim Zurten, uh, from is the head of the Energy Security Studies in the International Strategic Research Organization in Ankara, which is a think tank. Uh, 15 minutes, please. I should right now I'm standing between the lunch and you, uh, so I'll try to keep it short. Uh, my outline uh, is uh, composed of uh, five different uh, chapters, but I cannot have a vision uh, from the PowerPoint if somebody might help. <coughs> All right, I'll go with introduction, then I'll talk about why Eastern Mediterranean is important and uh, why uh, Turkey uh, played a uh, di di dif uh, different role in the region, what are the risks and opportunities, then I'll conclude my uh, presentation. Uh, uh, apart from this, I can say that we can uh, have uh, four different arguments for Turkish perspective. One of them is Eastern Mediterranean has become a sub-geography in Turkish strategic debt in political and economic terms, which was before only politically important for Turkey, but right now it has become economically important. Up until now, Turkey chose to use military operations in a limited uh, fashion in the region and uh, trying to uh, develop its capacities, uh, but uh, we have to admit that Turkey has to uh, face some capacity challenges due to uh, rising opportunities in the region. Uh, but uh, before uh, the co coming to conclusion part, once again, I'd like to emphasize that uh, if you want a solution in the region, if you want a bridge under the Mediterranean that uh, will bring peace to the region, I suppose uh, we should be thinking about damage control policies between Cyprus, Israel, and Turkey for reaching an economic solution in the region, uh, foreseeing the political challenges in the short term. So. I said uh, Turkey rediscovered Eastern Mediterranean as an important element of, of its strategic debt. Up until 2010s, uh, actually for Turkey, uh, there was a certain status quo in the region. Cyprus was an unresolved pol uh, political problem, but uh, energy discoveries, late, uh, later developments in Syria, and rising dispute with Israel in political arena caused Turkey to focus more on Eastern Mediterranean as a sub-element uh, of its foreign policy. Uh, as the uh, Syrian issue became a problem, uh, military existence uh, became more apparent. Now there are navies of Russians uh, in the region. Uh, from time to time, Iranians are coming, and uh, you know, uh, also Americans uh, are there. So there are no only American navies, uh, Israeli, uh, sorry, Turkish navies, Greek navies, and Israeli uh, navies uh, in Eastern Mediterranean. So the tension is getting higher. Uh, Greek Cypriot uh, has uh, started drillings with Noble Energy in 2009 and uh, went for a second round of licensing awarding Total, Eni, Kogas and Novatec. And uh, looking at all this picture, we might say that the status quo is changing. So, coming to energy issue. Why uh, Eastern Mediterranean became so important? I might say that uh, as uh, 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 the speaker sorry, uh, Mr. Meridor uh, said, uh, technical developments were in, was important, but also the finance was the key factor for Eastern Mediterranean. Oil prices at the beginning of 2000s was around $15, barris, uh, $15 per barrel, but now we are talking about $100 bar, uh, dollars per barrel. So you can take further risks uh, to look for further uh, uh, drillings in the Eastern Mediterranean, which was a problematic issue before because drilling costs around $400,000 per day, and offshore platform, uh, which costs around $304 million, you cannot take it easily. So technical developments are important, but we should also look at the finance. Second, uh, Eastern Mediterranean became important because suddenly everybody started to talk about Eastern Mediterranean as holding 3.5 trillion cubic meters of gas, which is really big because if you consider Azerbaijani reserves, we are talking about three Azerbaijan in the region, more than three Azerbaijan in the region. And most of this gas, it seems that going with Israeli ex uh, exclusive economic zone, because uh, Israel has uh, found out two biggest uh, reserves in the last decade, 
which are Leviathan and Tamar, which equals to around uh, 0 0.7 uh, trillion cubic meters, which equals to 300 to 400 billion dollars in total amount. So in the region, currently, we have proven reserves around 1 trillion cubic meters. This is almost an Azerbaijan. So Greek Cypriots also went further, uh, and I suppose Turkey uh, played a passive role while Greek Cypriots uh, playing an active role in the Eastern Mediterranean because uh, Eastern, uh, Greek Cypriots signed uh, economic exclusive zone agreements with Egypt, Lebanon, starting from 2003. But Turkey, uh, pursuing a goodwill diplomacy in the region, so just like in Aegean, uh, stayed outside of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean and signed no uh, exclu exclusive economic zone agreements with uh, none of these countries. And uh, in 2010, as uh, Professor Stergio said, enemy of my enemy is my friend, Israel and uh, Cyprus signed another exclusive economic zone. Turkey's response, uh, we have to say, was reactive. Uh, repression on potential companies before coming to drilling. Uh, it was uh, made during uh, 2003 to 2009. Then uh, we started to send uh, warsh warships, gunboats, and warnings. Even we sent uh, gunboats to Aphrodite, the uh, 12th block of uh, Greek Cyprus. But later we understood that you cannot uh, stop this by military options only. So Turkey started to develop some other measures as well, such as diplomatic measures and economic reciprocal measures. Signing continental shelf agreement with the uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. And later, Turkey uh, started to develop its technical capacity. Uh, but uh, to give signals, we send our 2D seismic survey ship, uh, which was an old-fashioned one, uh, dated back to 1970s. But uh, recently, we bought a new one for 3D seismic sh surveys, and it has started to work in the region. So. Uh, Turkey started to develop its capacity. And after signing uh, uh, agreements with Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, we opened an onshore uh, valve in TRNC. Uh, we signed new agreements uh, with Shell, uh, particularly in uh, our uh, economic, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in our continental shelf, especially in Antalya. And right now we are talking about by uh, building our own offshore platform to look for further gas and oil in Eastern Mediterranean. Coming to technical capacity, platform is a problem for Turkey, but we might say that Turkish engineers, they have good knowledge how to drill in open seas because for about a decade they are active in Black Sea with working with uh, 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 Chevron, Exxon uh, and uh, Brazilian firms uh, to look for gas and oil in the Black Sea. So when we have the platform, I suppose we would be uh, happily go and look for further gas, uh, particularly maybe in uh, Northern Cyprus economic exclusive zone as well. So this is the current picture right now. Uh, looking uh, here, you might see that uh, this is economic exclusive zone of Turkey, but this is uh, Cyprus, uh, uh, Greek Cyprus uh, announced uh, eco economic exclusive zone. So there is a problem here, but at least we might say that uh, there is a collision for 7th, 6th, 5th and 4th blocks uh, directly uh, with uh, Turkish economic exclusive zone. And uh, looking at uh, the recent uh, license, uh, licenses given to uh, foreign companies, Greek Cyprus chose to give licenses to 2nd, 3rd, 9th and 11th. They do not want to give licenses up until now to the uh, collided uh, blocks uh, with uh, Cyprus. So uh, I suppose Turkey's gunboat diplomacy is really effective at this part of the uh, island. But looking at here, we might say that uh, Turkish uh, Republic Northern Cyprus uh, offshore uh, blocks aren't that recognized by uh, Greek Cypriots. So I suppose uh, we need agreement with Cypriots, Israelis, or uh, when Turkey started to look for further energy with its own capacity in the region, with its gunboats, then the tension might uh, go upstairs because uh, Turkish Minister of Foreign Affairs says that uh, all of the options are staying on the table when we talk about the sovereignty issues in Eastern Mediterranean. So 
This is the uh, current uh, picture uh, for what to do with the gas in the region. Uh, there are a couple of options. Uh, these are uh, set, but one of them uh, is a uh, floating LNG terminal in Eastern Mediterranean, an LNG terminal in, uh, on Cyprus Island, a pipeline to Turkey, a pipeline to uh, Egypt uh, for LNG. Uh, these are all options, but uh, coming to uh, uh, short uh, conclusions, we might say that there are three uh, uh, forthcoming uh, options on the table. One of them is pipeline to Turkey, the other one is LNG terminal in Cyprus, maybe a floating LNG terminal as well. So we will build up LNG terminals or a pipeline for how much amount of gas. Uh, looking at Israel's uh, possible productions, we might think about 15 to 20 BCM of gas production up until 2020. Uh, they intend to consume almost 20, 12 or 13 uh, BCM of this, so we will remain with 3 to 8 BCM of gas. For Cyprus, uh, I suppose uh, considering the current amount of gas uh, discovered, it's 140 BCM. Even we find uh, further gas, it will be around 45 BCM of gas, not further than this, even uh, 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 unless we uh, they found they find uh, some giant uh, fields like Leviathan uh, in uh, their offshores. So in total, we are talking about 70, 13 BCM of gas available for the market. This is not uh, a game changer for Europe. Europe. This is not a game changer for Turkey. Uh, but this is an important amount of money for uh, Israel, Cyprus, considering their population. And it can play an important role uh, for Turkey's energy security and contribute to European energy security. But please do not exaggerate the numbers uh, because this is the reality. So we are going to build pipelines or LNG terminals. LNG terminals right now uh, costs around a couple of billion dollars. If you are going to build a floating LNG terminal, it will cost around 10 to 20 billion dollars. But uh, you know, uh, for uh, uh, 12 BCM gas or uh, 4 BCM gas, you know, this is big investment. This is sunk investment and it is open to competition in global terms because right now it's not only Eastern Mediterranean rising. As actually, in Eastern Africa, they have found vast amount of uh, gas, uh, which is even triple or quadruple times bigger than Eastern Mediterranean gas. We are talking about North Africa, Algeria now investing on shale gas. We are talking about Australia. It has already become an important actor in Asian uh, gas markets. So we are talking about US shale gas, Canada uh, shale gas. So LNG is the uh, most competitive arena for the next decade or couple of decades time. So uh, moreover, if you are going to build up LNG terminals, then you should have LNG terminals on the consumer side as well. And all these consumers uh, will be, uh, you know, consuming this energy in Asian markets or European markets, but uh, the right there, especially in Asian markets, the uh, competition are getting uh, harder and harder. Coming to Turkey, I'd like to say that uh, Turkish uh, energy uh, option is feasible uh, because uh, from Turkey, you can send it to Europe as well, but also you can consume the gas in Turkey because Turkish consumption right now is around 45 BCM and it's, a, it's uh, supposed to be rising to 65 BCM up until 2020 to 2025. Moreover, from Turkey, uh, in Europe, they are building up new interconnectors so you can have enough infrastructure to pump this gas from Turkey to abroad. So, to conclude, Turkey, I suppose, opted for limited military measures, but this doesn't mean that they are not on the table anymore, uh, still on the table, focusing more on developing capacity right now. Uh, in this regard, I mentioned platform and uh, 3D s seismic survey ship. Uh, and Turkey has an argument. The revenues belong to all the people in Cyprus from the offshore reserves, uh, uh, from uh, Cypriot's uh, gas reservoirs. If this is damaged, then Turkey uh, will be uh, uh, rethinking about its foreign policy. Gives positive signals. It says that uh, I was at Atlantic Council's meeting last week. Uh, Abdullah, you said that we want 
Eastern Mediterranean gas to be integrated to Turkey in a uh, fashion of interdependency, which will create peace and prosperity in the region. Taner Yıldız made the same statements. I suppose uh, the idea is standing it there, but we need a damage control because in Turkey right now, we are running for elections. In 2014, in 2015, there are important elections. If we keep until then, from 2016 to 2017, this gas can be online, but uh, up until then, we need private sector engagement behind the doors to talk about what to do. And it seems that Turkish private companies has already started talking with Israelis because Zorla Energy Company thinks about building a pipeline which, uh, which will worth $2.5 billion. And uh, right now, it seems that uh, some shuttle diplomacy is going on. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, and thank all the speakers for the illuminating uh, talks. And unfortunately, we don't have much time for discussion. And uh, you can you spare a few minutes? Uh, Mr. Mirdo has to go, so let's direct first the question to him, and then we can leave, and then we can continue for a few more minutes, please. Non-Muslim, I didn't say about Turkey. Yeah, I'm sorry, they didn't. Yeah. Okay. They yeah. Well, I, I don't want to be too personal. Uh, after all, uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey was elected by the, by the electorate in Turkey, not in Israel. It's the third time he was elected with a landslide. And uh, the economy is going very well, so this may be the reason why he's popular. I don't have particular uh, good marks for his uh, attitude towards Israel. I think he is acting in a way that is detrimental uh, to the relationship, uh, but uh, you know, things change and the world is a world of change and we hope for better times to come. He is not uh, happy with good relationship with us. It was uh, obvious uh, from for s about six or seven years now. I hope it will change, but I can't, I don't want to be too personal, it's uh, not right to do it. I'm you sorry I have to leave because I, I'm, you want uh, one question? I, I I Oh, okay, well, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. 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 Uh, so, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I have to correct you. Uh, Paul, uh, you mentioned that um, uh, Anastasiadis is uh, a president uh, who, uh, who actually uh, is promoting a solution less centralist uh, than uh, uh, his predecessor. Uh, sorry for that, I have to, to correct you. Um, all of the Cypriot uh, government, all of the Cypriot government administration after 1977 have been following the same policy. The same policy. Because they had to link up to the high level agreements of 1977 and they have pursued the so-called federal route. I personally disagree with this uh, explanation, um, uh, I, uh, but it is individual. Uh, I, I, I have argued uh, uh, for the two-state solution, uh, when it means uh, land for recognition. Uh, uh, <coughs> Turkey could uh, surrender us some land, and we could uh, recognize uh, the Turkish Cypriot Republic, which has been not recognized by any government uh, in the world except Turkey. But what you, you, uh, you think about uh, uh, the current uh, policy uh, uh, doesn't reflect uh, the reality. Although you mentioned a very, very uh, significant point that the, there are many differences um, among the federal states. It's true, and uh, um, uh, that's why I believe that um, the Cypriots have bad perceptions about uh, federalism. They 
doesn't know exactly what better and uh, how how it's functioning. And therefore, the Anan plan was based and that w therefore was a very bad plan because it was based on five yeah. different federal uh, models, federal, federal state models, Swiss, Belgian, German, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and that way was completely, in my in my opinion, uh, um, useless. Yeah, that's correct. A long uh, question. Please be brief. Any any more? <coughs> I recall what Abba even used to say: "Never talk to a hungry crowd." <laughs> so uh, <coughs> there are no un oh, please, yes. tremendous confidence building measure uh, on the table, and that is the city of Famagusta, which has been uh, on the table for nearly three decades now um, as a way of uh, beginning both reconciliation, reconstruction, and also uh, working around, as you said, some of the trade barriers that do exist. This, uh, perhaps uh, just uh, two, two words of background, uh, the city of Famagusta uh, is a predominantly Greek Cypriot uh, city Greek Cypriot neighborhoods of, of Famagusta called Barosha are, have been fenced off and are not being populated. And they've been tossed around as, a, as an idea uh, where the residents, uh, as par in part to solve a significant portion of the refugee issue, uh, would go back and essentially reclaim their, their properties. Uh, and in return, there would be a variety of, of uh, benefits and allowances to the Turkish Cypriot community, including uh, some of the options that were put on the table, direct trade with, with the European Union, uh, a, a rebuilding of the Famagusta port uh, for use as an international port. Obviously, it, it would be a, a huge, uh, it would have huge advantages in developing the energy um, uh, sector. Uh, and there's been also been talk recently about the possibility of linking this, uh, this proposal to um, legitimizing and, uh, the, the port, the airport of, of Erjan. So uh, it's on the table, but for some reason, uh, we're not getting any feedback, positive feedback from the Turkish side. Thank you. Dr. Anderson? <coughs> yeah, you have to answer that. You have to answer that. I didn't hear it acoustically sufficiently clearly. No, no, you do. Uh, I just uh, wanted to I, I just wanted to put down the option of Famagusta as a confidence building measure. You're obviously familiar with the option of Famagusta, rebuilding it, re, re, uh, rehabilitating it, uh, uh, opening the, the seaport uh, to direct trade for the Turkish Cypriots with the European Union. And now, as I understand it, there's also the possibility of including the Erjan airport into the package. And as I was saying, we're not getting the kind of positive feedback that we would like to see from the Turkish side. Well, no, I, I would like to reply oh, to that. I, I apologize to the man at the end there, but uh, my, my own hearing is not perfect, and so I'm, I'm, it's a fact of life. Um, to, to you, I would say this. Um, I was a bit confused by your message. On the one hand, since a long time ago, consistently the Greek Cypriot governments have argued for a certain type of strong federation, but then you say they are aware that there are five or 15 different types of federation to choose from. But my, my message would be <coughs> that um, unless the Greek Cypriot side in the forthcoming reopened negotiations communicate a clear message in favor of a much more decentralized federation, if you want to use the word, Unless there's a clear message along, the, along those lines, there's no hope uh, for the negotiation process. And, and I haven't heard that message yet. I mean, I've heard the message in terms of what the president is believed to think before the elections, but uh, since then I've heard nothing. <coughs> and so, <coughs> so uh, thanks very much.
much indeed, um, and we'd like to resume our discussion at 2.30.